Well, good morning. I just want to say that uh, as we get together today, there are really two things that are important at a time like this. One is to come into the Lord's presence and hear what he has to say. And the other one are the memories and the thoughts and the stories and the <clears throat> experiences that we recall and think back on and the encouragement and hope and courage that they give us. So as we get together, for those of you who are family and for other guests who have come, we just welcome you. We're glad that you're here. And uh, as we spend just a few moments now here together, I want to start with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you today that in the loss of Emily, we can know that you hold her future in your hands. We thank you for Jesus, for what he did on the cross of Calvary and for the difference that makes in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, today that Emily has touched our lives individually, each one of us. Please come and be with us in this service. Speak to our hearts and help us to be able to not only find joy in the past, but to find hope in the future. In Christ's name, amen. I want to start with sharing a scripture, actually a number of scriptures, that all come from the book of Psalms. A number of different passages. As I was talking with Esmer, he mentioned that uh, one of the passages that he and Emily found very comforting as she went through the things that she went through over the last months, but actually all through all of their lives, was the 23rd Psalm. And that's one of the verses that I'll start with here this morning, but it's a verse that many, many people know, and you probably have heard it numerous times, uh, because at times like this, as well as at other times during our lives, we find comfort in knowing that the Lord is our shepherd. But David writes in all of these passages that I'm gonna share briefly here right now. I'll start with that one in Psalms 23. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then in Psalms 103, David writes about the mercy and the graciousness and the goodness of the Lord. The Lord, he says, is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And then in Psalms 18, David says, the Lord is my rock and my, fort my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. And then one last verse from Psalms 18, David says, the Lord lives. Can you say amen to that? That is our hope, isn't it? 
The Lord lives, blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. As we move into our service this morning, I'm going to invite one of the grandchildren, Danny, to come up and to just uh, share with us a little bit about Emily's life and then uh, introduce or lead us in some of the other family members who are also going to share, uh, relatives. And if you would like to, others who have something they'd like to just share afterwards when we're done with that segment that he has, we'll give you a chance to do that as well. But Danny, come on up and share not only what uh, we've already maybe seen, if we got the shopper this morning, it was in there, but you may not have seen that this morning, but some other things that are on your heart about Emily. I'm going to start off reading the obituary. I just want to let you guys all know I've spoken to a lot of funerals at my brother's funeral, my cousin's funeral, my uncle's funeral. And this is probably one of the hardest times that I've had trying to stand up in front of everybody and kind of get out the words of how I feel. But we're going to kick it off. Emily French, 85 of Battle Creek, Michigan, passed away peacefully May 22nd, 2021. She was born in Chillicothe, Ohio on June 18, 1935, to James and Doris Burris. She married Esmer French on June 17th, possibly one of the greatest decisions she ever made. He survives. <laughs> Emma attended Chillicothe High School and graduated in 1953. She studied nursing at Columbia Union College in Tacoma Park, Maryland. She worked as a medical transcriptionist at the Battle Creek Hospitals and retired from the Layla Hospital after 40 years. Emily was a beloved wife, mother, grandmother. She enjoyed and truly lived life through simple pleasures, spending time with her children, grandchildren, and attending family gatherings. She loved Sabbath afternoon rides in the country with her husband. She enjoyed gardening, which I don't think I've ever seen my grandma really garden before. But I have seen a ton of cans in the basement, so I believe the canning part. <laughs> she would sit on the porch talking with neighbors while enjoying the flowers and watching her grandkids play. She had a wonderful laugh and a love of shoes that was passed down to her from her beloved Aunt Irma. She enjoyed her cats and faithful dog Happy, along with her grand doggy, Harley Jane. She loved her family and continuously put others before his own. Surviving her three daughters, Cheryl and Steve Mapes, Amy Hinton, and Julie Wright. Grandchildren, Emily Mapes, Amanda Mapes, Daniel Mapes, Lisa Iliff, Torn Mapes, Taya Mapes, Natalie and Sal Aguilar, Matt Wright, Lauren Grace Hinton, nine great-grandchildren. Man, couldn't have guessed that one. Alex, Clara, James, Engel, brother Donald Burris, along with many other beloved family relations. She was preceded in death by brothers Charles Crow, James Burris, Richard Burris, Jerry Joseph Burris, granddaughter Lacey Hamilton, niece Hallie Burris, grandson Stephen Wayne Mapes Arredondo, and her parents James and Doris Burris. The family will be receiving friends on Wednesday, May 26, 2021 from 2 to 4 p.m and 6 to 8 p.m. at the Richard, well, I think we all did that already. So, but take a quick minute to talk about my grandma a little bit. So when I moved away to Lansing and I was away from my family, anytime I wanted to come back or just kind of shoot back randomly, my grandma would always be home. If I couldn't get a hold of my mom or I didn't even, I just wanted to surprise everybody, I knew I could always go to my grandma and grandpa's house and she'd be there. She'd take care of my dog for me, which was huge. And I always appreciate the love that she had for us all individually. The love that she had goes deeper than anything I've ever known. I see it in my mom, I see it in my cousins, I see it in all of our family. It's hard for me thinking about my grandma being gone. She's always been there in my entire life and the fact that I won't be able to come home and see her anymore, it saddens me terribly. But a couple years ago, I had the pleasure of getting my little sister, Taya Mapes, and taking her out for her birthday. Not on her actual birthday, but I went by the house to surprise her. 
and uh, she was arguing with grandpa on the phone because she didn't want to go get her hair done. And, you know, I was just like, well, I need to get a haircut, so let's go get a haircut together. Uh, she said she didn't have anything to wear, so I went over and got Aunt Amy, and she got her dressed, and we took her to get her hair done. We went out to dinner, and you know, later on, she told my mom that you know, it meant a lot to her, and I, I know that there's a lot of little things that I've done in my life that I know that my grandma's got to recognize and know that I did them out of love and that I was always thinking about her. So, she will be missed terribly, but she's given something more to the world that not a lot of people can give, and that's love that lasts forever and runs deep. Thank you, everybody, for giving me your time. <laughs> Appreciate it. Whenever I went into town to see my grandma with my mom, grandma would always tell me that I was growing into such a strong young man. She would ask about school and how I was doing, what sports I was participating in, and how she wished she could come and watch me. I just want you to know that you meant the world to me. Only a heart as dear as yours would give so unselfishly. The many things you've done, all the times that you were there, helped me know deep down inside how much you really cared. It is the little things in life that meant the most. Taya and I were blessed to have a grandmother like you, and even when we did not say it, I hope you always knew that you meant the world to us. We'll always remember you. I love you, Grandma. Good morning. Uh, try not to get too emotional. My mom was a beautiful person with a big forgiving heart. I remember when I was a little girl, I used to write her little love notes and put them around the house so she'd find them when she'd get home from work. And all I would say was, I love you, and then I'd write very 10 times and much. That's all I'd ever say. And then when I was uh, a teenager, I gave my mom a lot of grief. Um, <laughs> I was definitely a problem child. And one day she came up to me and she gave me a package. And it was all those little notes that I gave to her. She gave them all back to me <laughs> to remind me. And that had such a profound effect on my life. <sighs> she was always there for me. Even when I was a little girl, I was afraid of the dark. I'd call her in my sleep. I wouldn't even know it. I called her so much. And I'd wake up, and there she'd be, laying there next to me always there for me. And she, she really helped me with my kids when they were little. She, they, they consider her like a second mom. As you know, I was trying to, a single mom, going to school, trying to finish my college education, and she just was, she did so much for me. I'm gonna miss seeing her sitting on the front porch. She did garden, Danny, you just don't remember. You were too little. <laughs> Yeah. Grandpa Burris used to have a garden, and we used to always go out there when I was little. I remember that. I'm going to miss her, though, waving, up, waving to me from the front porch when I get home from work. She was always out there. But there's the Psalms that I don't think you read. Um, Psalms 116, 15, and it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. To me, that means that Satan can't cause my mom any more pain or suffering. She's now sleeping in Jesus, waiting for the day that he comes to take her home to be with him forevermore. Hello, everyone. I'm also going to try and not get too emotional. It's hard to describe just how much she meant to me growing up. And I suppose uh, a little anecdote would be any time I was feeling low, she'd be the one I'd go talk to. And she'd try her hardest to make me feel better. And she'd get sad for me, try and take the sadness from me and, 
and just make me feel better. And we would get emotional and we would cry a little bit together. And, and then I remember she would make me fried egg sandwiches and we would laugh a little bit at that point. And yeah, I, I just remember growing up, we were always in very close proximity to her and my grandparents. And it's a bond I'll always cherish and always remember. And I just, I would, like people have already mentioned, she'd be on the porch a lot. And every time you'd see her, you would just want to go and sit down for a while and chat about your day. And she would just ask how you're doing. And she could always tell if you're a little low or a little high. And she would just try and make your day. Um, I was fortunate enough to come back and visit for, for a while these last couple of months. <clears throat> and one of the great memories was one night I was over there and my grandfather, it was just him, myself, and grandma, and my grandfather got out his guitar and he just started singing, singing and playing for my grandma. And it was very sweet. And it was, it was a great memory. And, I, and I'm glad I was able to witness it. So. Just, I loved her very much, and I'll miss her dearly. Thank you. It's funny. Um, I wrote this for my grandma. It's a very short and just sweet poem the other day. Um, but I, I couldn't get the words to finish it until, honestly, right before here. So I think that means I should say something. Um, like Matt and like our, my other cousins have said about my grandmother, incredibly sweet woman. And always there, always at the house, always there to have a chat, and always believed in people. Shortly um, before she fell ill, I went out to California, and we had a big chat um, as she, her sickness progressed. And she just always believed in her grandchildren, always. And I would tell her, the most bizarre things, like, oh, I'm going out to California. I want to sing. I want to maybe go to auditions. And she just was so supportive and so sweet, talking about her travels. We always talked about traveling together. Um, but this is just a short, sweet poem. It's called My Grandmother. Once upon a time, I had a grandmother named Emma. She had rabbin egg blue eyes and loved Disney and all things Mickey. She'd say, in that queue, <laughs> to just about everything. <laughs> Once you got her laughing, she'd say, boy, that's funny. She had a beautiful soul and a dog she named Happy, which I think says a lot because she made us all very happy. She'll forever be missed. So rest in peace, my sweet, sweet grandmother. You'll be forever in our hearts. Thank you. We sit right over there every Sabbath. We had a lot to talk about every week. So Fritchie would tell us, her husband, you sit down there and be quiet. Don't keep talking and talking and talking. But we was quietly talking, but we were forever talking. Any time Emily and I met, we were always happy together. She was my very good friend all the time. And I would miss her very much. Thank you. Her sister, Clara. When we talk about the front porch, my sister called me one day. She said, I had the most exciting time on the front porch. I said, you did? What happened? She said, well, I was sitting in my chair, and all of a sudden, something furry was, was going around my legs. And she said, I just thought it was one of the cats. She looked down, and it wasn't a cat. It was a skunk. <laughs> and all she could say was, 
oh, what do I do now? <laughs> and she just sat there. I think she probably put a little prayer up that she, you know, to God, what do I do now? So she just sat there, and pretty soon the little skunk went right down off the porch, right down into the wood, wooded area to the side of the house. Amazing how God takes care of us. But she had to call me and let me know that. It was so much fun. We want to listen to a couple different songs during our service today that the family had requested. But the first of those is the song, Fill My Cup, Lord. And that has a lot of meaning at a time like this because sometimes when something like this happens, our lives feel pretty empty and we sense the need for the Lord's presence with us. And so Kelly Lawrenson is going to share with us that song from the piano at this time. Fill my cup, Lord. Christ is the one who gives us what we need at times like this, isn't he? In Christ, there's help for today and, and hope for tomorrow as well. You know, Luke tells us in Luke 2 the story of Jesus' parents bringing him to the temple to be dedicated as the instructions in the Bible were and being a boy, they brought him 40 days after his birth. And there in the temple were two very godly individuals who were helping to minister to those who came and to dedicate the children that came to the temple. One of those was Simeon, a, an elderly priest. 
And the Bible tells us that he had looked for the Messiah to come for a long, long time. And he had been told by God that he would not die until he had seen the Christ child himself. And the Bible tells us that when he picked up Jesus to dedicate him, that he recognized the Son of God in this little baby. It says that he took him up in his arms and blessed God, saying, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. The second one that was serving that day was a God-fearing prophetess named Anna. And the gospel tells us that she was a very dedicated woman of, the Bible says, of great age. And it says there in Luke 2 <clears throat> that she had lived with her husband for seven years and then he passed away and she decided to stay on in the temple helping with the services and with the needs that were there in the temple. And coming in as Jesus, the, as a child, the baby was there, baby Jesus. The Bible tells us that she gave thanks to the Lord that she had seen the Christ child and she spoke of him to all of those who looked for redemption. And you know, it tells us in verse 37 how old she was. She was 84 of great age, the Bible says, 84. Well, in Emily, we have somebody who reached even beyond that great age of 84. She was 85, wasn't she? In fact, almost 86. Just another month and she would have been 86. But her life was intricately connected to and devoted to her Lord Jesus Christ as well. She became an Adventist probably in her early to mid-teens when her family joined the Adventist church down in Chillicothe, Ohio. And she lived there, went to high school there, as you heard, and as you see in the obituary that's published. But then Emma and Esmer moved to Battle Creek. And they came to Battle Creek in 1964 so that their children could go to church school, to the Battle Creek Academy, and learn of more of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was high on their agenda. And that's why they moved here. Esmer had a job that worked out for him to be here. And they came to the Battle Creek area. In fact, our church records said that they transferred their membership in and it was voted in on January 16 of 1965. So early in 1965, their membership was voted into our church here and they've been here ever since. 55 years, in fact, over 55 years here of helping out in our church, being a part of our church family, uh, sharing Jesus with others, bringing others to church at times as well. And the church and faith in Christ have been a very real part of their lives. I asked Esmer how they met. He told me I didn't have to tell everything I heard. <laughs> but it seems that one summer, Esmer decided to go to work as a call porter. And he went into the headquarters and they, they started to ask him where he'd like to work. And, you know, he gave them some input. And finally, the head man said, well, why don't you go down and work in Chillicothe, Ohio? And so he did. Now, a call porter, you probably already know, is somebody who goes from door to door selling books about the Lord. And the intention is to make a few dollars so that you can support yourself, but also to share Jesus Christ with others. And Ezra was doing that. 
And the first Sabbath there that he went to church on Sabbath morning, he went to the Odd Fellows Hall. Why? Because the Adventists who lived in Chillicothe didn't have a church building themselves. And so they were renting the Odd Fellows Hall, and that's where they were holding their services. And as he walked in, he saw this beautiful redhead playing the piano. And he was smitten. <laughs> and that was the start of it all. And wouldn't you know it, as Providence would lead, that family took him home for dinner as well. The second part of the story comes a while later. I don't know exactly how long, but a short time later, Esmer had joined the Army. He spent a couple of years in the Army. And he got stationed up in the Tacoma Park, Maryland area, the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. And you know what's in the Washington, D.C., northern uh, Tacoma Park uh, there in that city? A college by the name of Washington Missionary College at that time. You'll see it in the obituary listed as Columbia Union College. And today, actually a few years ago, they changed their name again. And today it's actually called Washington Adventist University. You see, we get better and bigger if we can call ourselves a university. But they're going to the Washington Missionary College. Esmer discovered that same beautiful redhead. She was there taking her medical transcription nursing degree. And that's how it got started from there. And it wasn't long until they were married. And the rest is history with their years together in Chillicothe, here in Battle Creek, and without them, we wouldn't have most of you. <laughs> so God blessed. If you would ask someone what Emma Lee was like, you'd probably get a lot of answers. But you would hear things like this that I heard from the family. Well, she was compassionate, forgiving. I think that one came from her troubled daughter, Julie. Uh, she mentioned I was a troubled child, you know, who gave my parents a lot of grief. Well, she remembered that she was abundantly forgiving. You would hear that she was emotionally supportive, especially of us as daughters, but of her grandkids and, and everybody. That she loved everybody. She loved animals. Happy the dog, at least three current cats. And uh, that love for animals has rubbed off on a lot of the rest of you, hasn't it? We won't go into that, but I know that all of the daughters have cats or dogs or both, and probably many of the rest of you as well. You would hear that Emma especially loved her, her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren. She was always telling her grandkids and maybe her great grandkids how big and strong they were, no matter how big or strong they felt, you know. Some of you remember hearing that, I'm pretty sure. You'd hear about her beautiful smile, her friendly ways, her sense of humor. That was already mentioned that she liked to laugh and had a good sense of humor. In fact, Cheryl told me about an experience one time where she made some comment as they were watching a TV program, and it was 30 minutes before Emily stopped laughing. You can ask Cheryl about that one. She can tell you a lot more about that a little later. She liked long car rides, <clears throat> she and Esmer, on Sabbath afternoons out in the country. She liked to see the things that God had made. Liked camping up at Camp Thornapple in Charlton Park up in the Thornapple River, up near Hastings, I believe. And some of you probably remember that as well. Some of you probably learned to ski, or at least tried to learn to ski, behind that boat that Esmer had out there on the lake. But Emily loved her family, and she loved others as well. Life is not always 
easy when you get into your 80s. In fact, it can be difficult well before your 80s. And you may have discovered that as well. I'm pretty sure that Emily was aware of that, especially over the last months. <clears throat> Things don't always go easily as we go through life. Just about a week ago, I received a text message on my phone from an individual who asked me with regard to what was happening in their life if God was really there and hearing and, and answering their prayer. Sometimes you wonder that. And I responded back to them with a text and shared some verses and some thoughts, in fact, a couple of texts in a row because they got a little long. And I shared some verses and some thoughts and encouraged them to continue to believe and to hold on to their faith and keep their hand in God's hand. And they texted me back within just a couple of minutes of my final text. It was a thank you text. They said, thank you. And then they said, you know, I guess I already knew what you said and shared. I just needed to be reminded. And it may be that way with you today. <clears throat> In fact, The things that I want to share today, probably for most of you, are not brand new. But maybe it's good to remember again some of what God has said. So what does the Bible say about the future of those who love the Lord? Isaiah 40, <clears throat> verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's true today with God's presence in our lives, but it's especially going to be true on that day when the Lord takes us to be with him in heaven and we receive new bodies and live without the problems of pain and suffering that this earth has caused. John says in Revelation 21, <clears throat> I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will, what does it say? You remember, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, John says, Write. For these words are true and faithful. You know, when we were talking <clears throat> last Monday there at the house, Esmer told me about one time when someone he met was especially discouraged. And just in reminiscing, he told me about how he took his guitar and he sang to them a song, an old song called God's Way. It's a song that's still heard occasionally, but really it's pretty much an older song today. It was mostly around in the 1940s to 1960s, early 1960s. You familiar with that song? I wasn't. So, Esmer, I looked it up, and you've given me enough of the words that as soon as I put them in on the internet, it popped right up. And I want to read the three verses to you of that song today. <clears throat> the song says, God's way is the best way, though I may not see why sorrows and trials often gather round me. He is ever seeking my gold to refine. So humbly I trust him 
my Savior divine. God's way is the best way. My path he has planned. I'll trust in him always while holding his hand. In shadows or sunshine, he ever is near. With him for my refuge, I never need fear. God's way shall be my way. He knoweth the best. And leaning upon him, sweet, sweet is my rest. No harm can befall me. Safe, safe I shall be. I'll cling to him ever. So precious is he. And Elmer didn't, uh, Esmer didn't sing that to me. In fact, he didn't even get out his guitar. But he quoted that, a few verses of that, or a few words from that. And then he said, you know, Pastor, that's how I feel today, still today. And I hope, family and friends, that you feel the same way today. God's way is the best way, isn't it? And we may not understand it all, but one day, if we are faithful, we will. And we'll say God's way <clears throat> was the best way, and he was there with Emma, with me, through my life's journey. We do not need to fear death. Jesus said in Revelation 1, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys, he says, of the grave and of death. 1 Corinthians 15 <clears throat> says, For in Adam, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Behold, I tell you a mystery, Paul writes. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And by the way, sleep is what the Bible calls death. Over 51 times in just the New Testament alone, when somebody dies, the Bible says they sleep. And it talks about being raised from that sleep on the resurrection morning. And Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, at the twinkling of an eye, when? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. There is a day coming when Christ will raise the dead, those who have loved him, and change them and take them to be with him in a land made new. We do not need to be afraid of death, nor face the future with uncertainty. We do not need to be afraid to leave Emily or any one of our loved ones in the hands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The thing to ponder and to consider seriously this morning is that seeing Emily again depends entirely on whether or not we have a personal, in-depth relationship with Jesus Christ ourselves. Whether or not we have accepted him and are living for him as our personal savior. There is nothing in life more important than that decision. I have seen lives changed by decisions that were made in funeral services, as people said, I want to see my loved one again, and then made changes in their lives, accepted Jesus, or began to live for Jesus in a way they never had before. And that is what makes all the difference. If you are uncertain in your life today about that decision, or about your relationship with Jesus Christ, 
I would encourage you to begin to think seriously about where you are at with the Lord. For that is what will allow us to be together one day again. David understood that. The one who wrote the book of Psalms with all of those verses that I read and that some of you read from other Psalms that were in there this morning. David, in Psalm 17, verse 15, says, I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. He's saying, when you come again, when the resurrection takes place, when I awake with your likeness, with that new body that you have given me and you take me back to be with you, it'll all be worth it. I will be satisfied with things, with where things are at and the decisions that I have made to follow you. Emily felt exactly the same way. Today she awaits the resurrection morning. There's a day coming very soon when there will be a grand family reunion, when we will meet our loved ones again and we will see our Lord return. And we're going to close our service today by listening to the song Family Reunion that Buddy Hotelling wrote. And it's a song that talks about that great and wonderful day and that grand event when we can be together in a family reunion once again. Thank you, Pastor Moore. Esmer, I remember when I was a lot younger, you coming out to our house, and you and Dad would play guitar together, and I remember you singing, and when you left, uh, I remember Dad saying, oh, Esmer can really sing. And I, as, as I heard the story earlier of the young man talking about how you sang to, to your beloved wife, and I just want to let you know it won't be long, you'll be able to do that again. Come a day when we see Jesus and know the troubles of this world are through. When in the east we see our Savior coming as he promised, making all things new. First we'll hear the angels' trumpet blowing clearer, brighter, as the cloud draws near. And then we'll hear sweet Jesus say, I love you. And I'm so glad that all of you are here. At God's family reunion, Jesus Christ, our brothers at the throne, family reunion God has come to take his children home all of us on earth no separation when someone who you love so much is gone leaving you with teary eyes and memories Longing for that promised golden dawn When God will finally raise his sleeping children And they will meet their loved ones in the air And tears of joy will flood the streets of heaven Brother, I can't wait to see you there at God's family reunion, Jesus Christ, our brothers at the throne, family reunion, God has come to take his children home. 
No more sorrow, no more pain. Ever with the Savior to remain. No more heartache, no more grief. Only joy beyond belief. At God's family reunion, Jesus Christ, our brothers at the throne. children home. Let's pray. Our Father, today we thank you that we have been blessed with Emily and knowing her here on this earth, that she's been a part of our lives a part of our family. We thank you that she knew and loved you. And we look forward, Lord, to that day when you will come again, when all of those who sleep in Jesus will be brought forth from the graves, and those of us who are living to see you come will be changed instantaneously, as the Bible says, and raised to meet you in the air. I ask, Lord, today, for the family especially, for each relative, that you would be with them. Because as we go on, life will be different without her here. But Lord, we know that with Jesus by our sides, that it will be okay. And that one day soon, we will see you come and everything can be what you have planned for it to be when you created mankind. So bless each family member, Esmer, the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, each family member, brother, sister, relative. Lord, bless them with strength from your throne and help us to be ready on that day when you return. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. 